Our message for today is entitled, The World's Culture and the Church's Scripture. So we invite you to get your Bible and join us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 as we begin our study in verse number 1. One of the issues that defines our culture is the argument whether there are absolute standards of truth and morality. On one side of the question, everybody is supposed to accept one universal standard. On the other side, each person sets a standard based on his own individual beliefs, preferences, and experience. Now imagine for a moment, if you will, how impossible it would be to drive a car if everybody decided individually what the standards would be. One person may think that 50 miles an hour is fast enough, but the car behind may be convinced the minimum speed should be 80 miles an hour. One group of people may prefer to drive on the right-hand side of the street while others prefer the left. The result would be chaos. and Nobody would get anywhere. The same is true when it comes to the cultural and moral climate of the nation. You see, beloved, until recently, American society recognized a universal standard of moral behavior, and it was based on courtesy, order, and propriety. See, it was expected in school, on public streets. It was expected at entertainment events and everywhere else that people gathered together. But in the mid-1960s, public morality underwent a drastic transformation. The previous standards were suddenly declared irrelevant and judgmental. You can't tell me how to act became the new cry in favor of individual rights. But before this time, the church and the community at large held to the same standard of behavior. Even those who weren't regular churchgoers recognized the value of shared standards. After all, those standards were as old as the first settlements in America. And they produced a nation that became the freest, richest, and most powerful nation in the history of the world. Throughout all this cultural upheaval, the true church remains a rock of consistency. There are many temptations to change the culture of the church, to make it more attractive and more relevant, but the message of the church and the message of Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is that the church is to stand apart from the sinful culture of the world. No matter what the moral climate of the world, the church lives by the Scriptures. And Scripture alone is the Christian standard for faith and practice. So let's read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the first five verses, beginning in chapter, beginning in verse 1. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Now the description of people that Paul warned Timothy to avoid in the opening verses of chapter 3 has changed very little ever since the first century. The Apostle Paul listed 19 personality traits which could easily describe almost any criminal on the evening news. But another disturbing type of person then and now is the cultural Christian. See, this is someone who goes to church as a social activity but puts nothing into it and gets nothing out of it. Why, in a way, these are the most dangerous people of all because on the outside they do what Christians do. They go to church, read the Bible, sing hymns and praise songs, but on the inside they're living for themselves. 
In short, while professing to be Christians, they express the opposite in their lives, attitudes, and actions. The one word in Paul's list of 19 characteristics that may best describe the cultural Christian is traitors in verse 4. I think it's worth stopping for a minute to think about our own behavior and attitude toward the church. Let me ask you, do you look for the lost as Jesus did or do you let them go? Do you work to bring Christian unity to your church fellowship or do you leave that up to somebody else? It's possible to get in the way of church evangelism and teaching without meaning to. So we should all be on guard to ensure we avoid the symptoms of cultural Christianity. Beloved, the Bible is to be the standard for the church. But many churches have drifted away from biblical standards of behavior and worship to become popular in the community or to increase their attendance. They have decided to let the culture dictate what the church should do. Beloved, that attitude is dangerously in opposition with the teachings of Jesus. And now, reading again in chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, we read, For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. Now, beloved, about all we know of Janus and Jambres, the two men mentioned in verse 8 is that they were magicians in the service of the Egyptian Pharaoh, and they opposed the godly teachings of Moses. Now, what could be worse than to go down in history as a biblical example of how not to behave? These two men represent the many people who cling to false religion. Surrounded by the trappings of magic and the occult, Janus and Jambres are among those who resist the truth because the truth will rob them of personal power and force them to acknowledge that all power comes from God. This quest for power is also what prompts followers of false religions to take advantage of the spiritually or morally weak. This is referenced in verse 6 by the phrase, gullible women loaded down with sins led away by various lusts. You see, they can't claim the true power of God, so they act and command in their own power, which leads their followers to ruin. Beloved, our world is full of false religious leaders who claim the power to make their followers rich, to cure their illnesses, or to somehow make life easy for them. Even churches today often worry about acceptance and membership growth more than they do about preaching the biblical truth. The Apostle Paul himself is an example of the fact that Christians are never promised an easy life on earth. No, beloved, on the contrary, they're taught to expect just the opposite. And in the short run, it's not difficult to attract followers by promising them things that satisfy their fallen and selfish human nature. But those false prophets eventually lead to disappointment and despair while the true Christ lights the path to eternal life. And now we continue reading in verse 10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, beloved, the stronger your faith is, the more it will be tested. The Apostle Paul was one of the greatest Christian leaders of all time, but he suffered greatly 
In verse 11, Paul wrote, what persecutions I endured. Persecution may be the best evidence of all that you're living a Christ-like life. In verse 12, Paul said, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul's persecutions are described in Acts 13 and 14, beginning when the Holy Spirit set him and Barnabas apart to do the work of God. Paul traveled to Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra preaching the gospel, but the more successful he was, the more he was persecuted. He was expelled from Antioch by the Jews. He was threatened with assault in Iconium, and he was stoned and left for dead in Lystra. Paul was a man who was faithful to Jesus and who lived in a way that reflected his beliefs. He didn't live comfortably while asking others to sacrifice. He didn't claim power in the name of Jesus and then try to imply that anything he did was out of his own strength and wisdom. Paul's sacrifice gave him the authority to tell others how to live their lives. By giving us all to Jesus, he could claim Jesus' infinite power to speak through him. And continuing in verse number 14, we read, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Beloved, in two sentences beginning in verse 14, Paul pointed out with incredible clarity the purposes of Scripture as he had learned it over many years of service to Christ and had it revealed to him by the Lord. In verse 15, Paul said, The Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Beloved, this is a foundational truth that separates Christianity from every other religion and the inerrant Bible from all other sources of religious instruction. Christians should be familiar with the Bible and build on that unshakable foundation for a lifetime. In verse 16, Paul said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good word. Now, the Greek word for inspiration literally means God breathe or breathe out by God. There is no stronger image of the origin of the Bible than its being the very breath of God who created everything. This idea is reinforced by the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, which says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so, beloved, this inspired, God-breathed teaching is ours so we may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The reference to man of God in verse 17 is used in a generic sense to include all believers. And so all the same people who were described in verse 2 as lovers of so many evil attributes can be transformed, completed, and equipped by God's Word. Oh, God's Word is powerful. God's Word is so powerful that it reveals the thoughts and intents of our hearts. And all of us need to be firmly grounded in the Word of God and resist the false wisdom of our culture.